Hello and welcome to Inclusiverse episode four. It's Nick Hamilton here, your host, alongside Kali Kalida, who's on my right. She's looking absolutely wonderful this morning, I would say. Absolutely wonderful. And we're here talking about uh, Black History Month and the importance and how significant it is uh, for black history and our lovely guests that I have in front of me. We've got David Wright and Kofi I'm a Gohini. <laughs> That's a good try. Did I say that right? That was a good I'm try. so sorry if I That's got that good, wrong. Man. So please introduce yourselves. Yeah, so um, I'm Kofi, I'm Mark Gohini. Um, I've been working at Blue Square for about seven years. Uh, currently working as an OTM and yeah. I guess that's pretty much me at the moment. Amazing. Yeah. David? Yes, I'm David Wright. I've uh, been working at Blue Square for six years and I'm a trainer and um, yeah, loving the work. Right, Really happy to be here. Happy to oh, be here. so sweet. Look at you, DW. <laughs> I'm always happy to have you around. You know this. Thanks, Kelly. I am really, really just grateful to be on this episode. I think for me personally, I'm going to be taking more of a back seat just to listen and understand. Mm. I think this is a really, you know, really, really important to to discuss and understand from your personal experiences around this table and also to help our listeners who may not know necessarily quite a lot about what Black History Month is to understand a little bit more about it. So I guess open floor, I don't know, whichever one of you guys would like to go first. What is to you the importance of Black History Month? Um, I would say it's probably a great time to remember um, not all the like not all the atrocities that kind of happened within that time because I don't feel that that's what signifies what Black History Month is. It's a great time to remember all the great Black leaders that we've had in our community and all the great things that they've done to allow us to live the way that we do now. Because I think that's probably the the best thing about Black, Black History Month. It's also about you know sharing a light on what current pe- what people are kind of doing now. At, at, like there's a lot of people who are in great positions at work and. You know, there's a lot of people who are doing great things for society in general. Um, and it's great for to have a month where at least where we can share a light on those people. We might share a light on them 12 months of the year, but it's a great opportunity to do that and, and really, you know, pull a focal point on them for at least that time in the month. So that's, that's what I think um, is, is really good about Black like, History Month. Yeah, I mean, I literally echo exactly what Scofie said because, you know, it, it's all about that positive. It's all about the learning, you know. Mm. You know, know from whence you came, there's no limit to where you are going, as I was always told when I was younger. So having that, you know, purpose of, you know, what am I doing? How can I affect things going forward? You know, got to start at home and then you move forward. But also, you know, when you have children or have a family, what are you departing to them? And that's something that's always, you know, resonated with me with me and I've got to make sure that you know I kind of carry my learnings forward and then they can put on top of it and it just builds and builds so yeah. that's a bit of me. And when you go to, to, to this episode what um, what sort of sort of stood out for you what did you want to, to share what did you want to give um, to the episode and, and what was your reasons behind of you know being a part of, of episode four of Black History Month? So for me it's definitely about kind of you know People understanding that your background may be varied, but it's kind of where you're going is is really important. Um, and my background is is quite varied, um, having come from a large family and you know doing going to different schools and different colleges and having different experiences from one end of the spectrum to the other. That's been really like a key thing and a, a really big learning that I've taken into the workplace. So it's just a real kind of understanding. So that's the reason why I'd like you know I'm so happy to be on this episode. When I got the call, it's like being called up for England. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, we'd love to hear more about your story. I mean, you, you've you just brushed over it like really yeah. loosely there. Um, if you could tell yeah. us a little bit more. So, I mean, be great. Nick, Kelly, everyone. Um, you know, me growing up in like a, you know, East London, come from a big family where I consider them like my family, my brothers and my sisters as like our friends because it's quite a large family I came from. But then going to a school that was very multicultural, mixed, very mixed school, um, lots of experience, lots of different cultures all blended into one school. And then in my final year of like my GCSEs, going to a school where I was only one of five black or African people, or Asian people in the entire school. Wow. So the literal change was very dramatic what, what in you, my thinking. What, what year was this? this was like my final year so for GCSEs. I yep, yep. um, can't remember, it's like fifth year now. Fifth year? Oh, that's an old yeah. one, isn't it? Don't know what it is now in the, the current form, but yeah, the, the, the original like fifth year where you, um, you're finishing your GCSEs 
And that was like an absolute shock to my system where I'm sitting in the classroom and people are just staring at me like, you know, people say, where are you, where, why are you here? Mm-hmm. Like, where, where'd you come from? I'm like, yeah, I went to Stratford School, I went to this school. It's great, great fun, such, such a mix. But they're like, you know, you walk into the school playground and thinking, oh, they're like, oh, do you play football? Do you play basketball? And that's about it. And you, the comments then starting to flow after about a week. And would you say that was like the biggest difference? Did you feel like you were treated differently yeah. when you came over to your your kind of the last school before your GCSEs? Yeah, I definitely was treated differently. Definitely. Um, it was it was different in the way that, you know, you were kind of almost like a novelty. Wow. Um, where, you know, you would be in that school and that's where they were like, oh, wow, is he, is he, is he, is he do, you, do, you like, do you like football? And, you know, one day I've got a, a banana thrown in my head in the classroom and nothing was done. It was a source of fun. Um, and I was like, this is a bit crazy. I'm going home and telling your parents, listen, this is what's going on, you know, and your brother's going, you what? Right, we're coming down. I'm like, you can't do that because I've got to go to this school for the next six odd months. So um, that was a shock. But then finishing my GCSEs and then going into um, college. Now college was amazing. It was great, but my first three days was a, I definitely say a cultural change because I went from a very, very white school out in Essex over to a college where on the day three, I came home and I said to my brothers, you know, we're sitting down having a, the chat. And I said, you know what, lads? They're like, yeah, what? I said, you know what? There's a lot of black people in my college. <laughs> And my brothers did exactly that. They <laughs> laughed, hilarious. And they were cool. said, mum, mum, mum. He just said there's a lot of black people. And at that point, that's when my mum decided, right, I'm going to teach you about black history from Jamaica, from the UK. I'm going to teach you as a whole. She gave me books to read to make sure I understood, you know, where I was coming from. You know, mum, she went to the house, um, housewives, yeah, the housewives craft institute for like homemakers and things like that. So she was great in that like, sewing and doing anything to do with the house, cooking, everything, even looking after the finances of the home. She can do all of that. She was amazing. Um, it kind of shaped what I kind of went into from college days. So um, that was great. But I had to really learn about my history because I came home and I felt a little bit of a chink in my armor. Mm-hmm genuinely felt that that poke and I was like they can't say that and the boys at the college you know that I had some friends from um, Saudi Arabia had some from South Africa Kenya Nigeria Ghana we sit down and have conversations and they would say things and I wouldn't understand Mm. so at that point I knew I had to do a little bit more reading and that gave you more confidence absolutely it did yeah I understood why certain people would say certain things even down to what clothing they wore to college and what that really meant. Mm. Um, when you saw those kind of patterns, the, you know, the clothing on certain days, they would wear, you know, a different shirt. I'm like, what's that shirt about? Oh, yeah, yeah, so this is my tribe and X, Y, Z. But also yeah. we had like Portuguese people, Spanish people, and I used to play football. That was a common denominator, it was football for me. Um, football and food. And loved it. They used to sit down and talk to me about, you know, Galau. I used to love coffee in a glass from Portugal. It's beautiful. Certain places I used to go around in South London to drink and have food. That was really important. But the importance of understanding my Jamaican heritage mm. and understanding like, the African um, heritage as wide, that was a, a very big learning for me. So, so once you'd learnt, learnt um, no, your, your history as such, did you feel that others around you um, you know, started to understand you more because you were more confident or you, or was it a point where, or did you get to a point where you understand, you understood yourself a lot more, your history a lot more, but still people around you um, maybe looked at you differently, didn't understand you, didn't understand your, your history, where you came from? So, I mean, they did understand my history. It was the confidence of knowing more, but also when you go to, um, <clears throat> when you're in an environment where, you stand out because of how you are, how you dress, and the way you talk. When I went to college, you know, there was a, you know, a very firm black stance in there, lots of slang, and I didn't understand it because I spoke quite well mm-hmm. at the time. I mean, it's obviously still slang. I'm an East London boy, you know what I mean? But <laughs> I was made to kind of speak more polished because my parents wanted me to because they felt that if I could, then 
um, I would fit in a little bit more. It'd be a lot more easier. See, even that though, like going home and then your your parents feeling like they have to reaffirm that that messaging that oh you must speak this way or dress this way to have that relationship in your school because you went to a school that didn't understand you and I'm going to assume and correct me if I'm wrong there were no teachings about black history in that school there was nowhere for you to go to to maybe understand more or 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 understand why people were talking to you this way and how disrespectful that was because you may not necessarily have known what was hateful and what was ignorance I think that's a that's a massive difference yeah. Because if somebody says something out of ignorance, they can be, oh, that's their responsibility to educate themselves. However, in a school environment, you know, as educators, you, you, it's your duty to care for and, and understand every single student, regardless of race, yeah, culture, well, we know, background. We know that that's not going to be the case. No, no absolutely not. Most of the teachers aren't really edu- educated on the matter anyway. No. Yeah. So, yeah. It doesn't help. And, and uh, Kofi, please, um, you know, elaborate on, on your story, your background, yeah. share whatever you feel. Um, yeah, you know, comfortable with sharing. I mean, I, I can go back to school. So, I mean, school for me was, I, I grew up in, in like South London. So in South London, it's very, very multicultural out there. So I've never really had an issue where I felt like, you know, the minority in the school. I've, and to be honest, I've always, in, the, in all the schools that I've been to, they've always been filled with like more, probably more black people than there was white. Um, especially in Deptford, where that's pretty much what you're going to get. So in in that aspect, like I felt like I was I wasn't I didn't feel so secluded. Um, but the issue that I had was like when 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 it's surrounding like Black history and the history to do with Black people in general, it was very um, slavery driven, negative, and it was never really it, like they would every now and again focus on the Rosa Parks, the Martin Luther Kings, the you know, like the people that are kind of like out there and pushed out there like to you, but not really kind of getting into the actual detail of it. And it's more like, okay, we'll talk about those, but we'll also tell you about the slave trade because that's part of your history. But is it part of our history? Like, is it really part of our history? I, I don't see it to be my history. I see it's it natural, to be- It's a natural thing for them to think that that's part of part your history. history. Yeah. And so they decide to teach you about it. And like, as, as a kid, you're thinking, oh, this is my history. Like, this is what we went through. But really and truly, like, like history is, you know, what did a certain black per- person make in, in that created a, a rift in the future and created this and this and that. I feel like that's more kind of like rooted to it, somebody's history. Like what did, what did like that significant impact to not, not you know, slavery. That's, that's not my history. That's just so backwards in so many ways because yeah. other, you know I, I remember learning about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and things like that but there are so many other people that were so many so much more so, influential yeah. as well it's almost like you were put in a box oh well we'll talk to you about these two people because they're they're part of your history but what about everybody else that has made a significant change yeah. and that has positively done something yeah. you're not told about that yeah uh, yeah. And I think that's a, a big thing, like around mo- multiple schools in general. And I feel like th- I, I haven't been in school for a very long time, so I don't know if that's changed yeah. or if in, in terms of any curriculum. But like, you know, at the time, I feel like that was widely spread probably across the world where most people are being taught these things in school about black history. Which is wrong. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for, 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 for me, when I was when I was a kid, I mean, I um I was the only person of color at my school, mm. at both of my schools, primary and secondary. So I was surrounded by white people, if I'm honest, and my, my mother's white. Um, you know, so I um, I was also the only disabled person. So I I was I had pretty much like a double whammy. Yeah, you know, I stood out like a, a sore thumb. So I was in a wheelchair. I was the only only person of color, and um, and the only disabled person as well. So it was really really tough. For me, so I would say I'm like, <laughs> I would say I'm like the whitest black guy you will, you'll ever meet because I've been around white people my whole my whole life, um, and and how I started to to learn about you know it being a person of color and black history started with the the film um, Roots. Ooh, yeah. And that place was not. <laughs> yeah, straight away the heart. It's really hard to to watch. I didn't. I didn't like any of that sort of stuff. I didn't. I didn't like pain. I didn't like people struggling. Um, but straight away, it, it was nothing 
positive around yeah. you know the history of, of, of black people it was it was more this is the pain they went through this is yeah. the struggle they went through so if you're a black person you're gonna you're gonna struggle yeah this is how it this is how it started from day one and that's how it then uh, manifested in my mind um you know and it all related around slavery straight away and there was nothing positive that i said or felt that i could take away from yeah that moment it was shoot i'm a i'm a black guy and <laughs> i'm a disabled black guy and all people perceive around black people from what i understand at that moment was just slavery and struggle yeah yeah so so when um when you started to to grow into to yourself get a bit more stronger into to who you were where did you where did you go from from school into into your into your adult life um so to be fair what actually prepared me like to get to that point um when i was in school my mom enrolled me into something called mandiani mm-hmm. uh, mandiani was essentially like the they essentially taught us how to be men from like young adults and what they taught me in that in those sessions literally every day after school on a tuesday what they taught me on the, in, the, in those sessions were, was completely invaluable because like they taught us about our history they taught us about like drugs they taught us about like like religion they taught us about a whole bunch of things that we didn't understand or get taught in school so i've managed to get that kind of like history taught to me um and that kind of led to me kind of having a whole different mindset when kind of like going into college, university and later, later in life at, at this point in time because I learned more than just slavery. I learned about all the, le- the leaders. That I learned about Haile Selassie. I learned about King James. I learned about like what was happening during slavery, like the, what people were doing to kind of like lift themselves up. Like I wasn't learning about slavery. I was, was learning about what they were doing in that time. Mm. Does, and this goes for both of you guys. Um, do you feel that um, the youth of today, black black youth of today, um, do you think they they give off a positive light of of, of black people? Oh, you go first. Me. And the reason why I ask that is because you know, there's I I feel there's um, you know a lot of um, black kids that are from underprivileged backgrounds get themselves into a, into a lot of trouble that that um, you know they don't need to really get themselves into that sort of trouble. But then that puts a real bad sort of outlook mm. on on all of us. Yeah, mm. as, yeah, yeah. as people do. Agree? I get that. Agree? that. I get that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I I think that a large proportion of it. Um, is down to a couple of things. One, choice mm. of who they're with. They make a conscious choice. Um, but also, um, we have to be very honest with ourselves and say, are we teaching them enough? Do they have enough um, content on, let's be honest, social media that gives them that information? Um, but I also feel that it has to come from home. I mean, I have, you know, two children myself and I literally have to kind of start from home with my own children because I know for a fact they've gone to, you know, both my boys have gone to they've gone to grammar school because I understand the worth, the need for education, but I've also taught them and so did my partner, teach them at home, you know, about the culture, about understanding, about making sure they make, you know, conscious choices. And they've got to be informed, good, bad, or indifferent. They have to be, have, make informed choices because that's what it is. It's a choice. Um, but some kids feel that it's the easy path for them to just simply, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Mm. I mean, obviously, you guys, um, you know, work at Blue Square. Um, you know, you're in the workplace. You know, how have you been? Um, how have you been perceived since? You know, coming into your adult lives now and and, and being a part of. Well, for me, I mean, though. I think I'm from almost like a different era, Kofi. You know, you're quite young. <laughs> I'm going to be very old. Oh, why do I feel old? Um, but it's, I think that we we need to perceive ourselves, well, not give an impression, but be ourselves, be genuine. And I think that, you know, coming into the workplace for myself, coming into the world of fashion, first of all, um, it, you're perceived as, okay, cool. Do you work in the workrooms? Yes, I did. Yeah, garment design and construction. Loved it. 
put things together, make things look good, understand where you're going. But, you know, in that field, it's now very mixed. I'm very, very happy to say it's a very mixed field and where your talent really does shine. However, there are certain elements there that was quite trying, you know, especially when you get to the high end. It's very, very, you know, trying and you have to really show your ability and just hope that someone sees it. Um, but in Blue Square, I felt that I've actually seen a lot of change. They've done a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that's ground, you know, kind of, I think it's kind of groundbreaking. We've put a lot out there in sort of content, we're part on our socials, even as a trainer, the way I'm treated as a trainer is great. And when I started, it was, look, yeah, we know your talent. Cool, let's go. And it was no kind of biased at all. It was a very much an open door scenario. And I always say to, you know, new starters, when I first started, it was, okay, three months in, I want you to do this product called Unbound. You're going to have this room and you're going to do the history of fashion against the history of TV. And it was like the first time I'd ever done anything like that. But the support I got to bring it out was amazing. So for me, this is the reason why I'm like, you know what, it's, it's such a good company to work for mm -hmm. because they allow you to be yourself and allow you to show your talent and move forward, which is great. So if you're genuinely yourself, keep true to yourself. Other people see it and you can work with it, but also educating the people around you really does help. Mm. People have asked me certain questions about certain phrases, you know, here in Jamaica, and I, I don't speak Patois at all, apart from when I get a little, little bit upset. <laughs> it might pop out, um, but, but to be very honest with you, I understand it when I teach people about it. Oh, right, this is where it's coming from. I got it. And it's, you know, it's something that's very kind of dear to me that I understand it, but do other people understand it? Do other people know where I'm coming from? There's definitely a difference between curiosity yes. and like a statement. So like, I, you know, I, I, I don't understand necessarily a lot about your background, but if, it, if I wanted to ask you something, there would be a way that I would ask you about it. Do you know what I mean? It wouldn't just be, why have you said this? It would be, help me to understand you know, I can go and way and research it to my end, but I, I don't know your, your, your history, your backgrounds, your, you know, what your culture means to you. I can go on Google as, as everyone else can and find articles and everything, but yeah. I will not know you as an individual unless I go to you directly. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So whilst we're also on the topic of, of Blue Square as a company, David, I know you've been working really closely on a particular project. You tell us a little bit more about it. So yeah, I've been working on a project called Cultural Heroes. Um, and Cultural Heroes, it literally started around the Black History Month, but we're looking at the wider culture of Blue Square. Um, and Cultural Heroes is all about the person who they feel is their hero. Um, like for instance, my cultural hero is my mum, because she really did teach me a lot about my culture where I couldn't really find most of it in the book. But um, but yeah, that was just my feeling. But for other people, for from other cultures, we have, you know, Irish, we have Hungarian, we have, you know, Ga Ghanaian, oh, get it right. And we've got Nigeria, we've got a whole host of different people, but you know, we look at people and think, oh, it's just English, but there is so much more to that person. Mm. And that is where cultural heroes really does come in and they talk about themselves and who their cultures, who inspires them on the day-to-day -day or throughout their life. So, so how would you feel that, um you know, how can the the workplace continue mm. to make you feel more accepted, more yourself? Um, you know, there might be listeners um, listening at, at the moment, you know, nervous about making a step or making a change or applying mm. for a certain role within within a business, yeah. um, you know, because of the color or because of how they feel they could be perceived. Mm. What would you, what would you say to them? But also what would you say to, um, you know, the, the employers, um, that that are, are hopefully going to be open and mm. uh, you know allowing anybody to come through the door. I would say I've been one of those people who was like scared to work for roles because of my name. My name is hard to pronounce, but so like when you think about like I apologize at the start. Oh no, it's all right. <laughs> it's all good. It's all right. Like, you know, don't worry about it. David Wright is very, very you know, yeah, it's very yeah, generic. It's, <laughs> see, see, with a yeah. name like David Wright, you could probably get any job. Like with my job, I'm with, my day, now, <laughs> with my day, now, I can understand. Like, I, I mean, I can't understand, but at the same time, like some people, I've I've had a lot of like roles where I'd, I'd feel like I didn't get it because of my name because it's it's hard to pronounce. Like, it's it it sounds very long and it's it sounds crazy to think about it, but like I know that's to be that to be a very very true fact because I've gone to interviews in the past and and I felt that. 
you know, like I, I felt as soon as they've met me, I'm, in fact, I, I've actually, um, I have two names. I have Keith and I have Kofi. I've, when I've used Keith, I've got more interviews as, when I, as, as opposed to when I've used Kofi. And that's the truth. That's <laughs> shameful though, from a, from a company what perspective. Honestly though, when I worked as a graphic designer, I got that job because I put Keith there instead of Kofi. And when I went there, she was like, oh, you know who's Kofi? I was like, yeah. <laughs> but even <laughs> like you, you laugh terrible, about what? it, but you have to like having to censor yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We laugh. It's almost like if you don't laugh, you you cry about you that. Cry. That's a terrible you know, thing. It's terrible. But um, what I would say um, is at least to employers anyway is like have some schemes in place where we can actually like learn in different within different fields. Like I would love to learn more about what the marketing team is doing and the kind of what they do. Maybe I have a, um, you know, a trait that kind of like would help the company and then I can kind of learn about it and kind of go forward. Or maybe there's something in finance that like just having different like ways to kind of like learn about different departments within the, com within the company. Then you can just promote people from the ground up and everyone kind of stays within the business. Because I feel like there's a lot of people who work for Blue Square, especially who have been here for long times. Like I've been here seven years, David's been here six years, and we've all come from like lower positions and kind of moved our way up. And um, you know, it's because people love this company. People like working for Blue Square. People like working for Samsung. And you know, it would be nice to have that kind of like going into different departments and stuff like that. Which is, you know, I know it's something that we 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 do a lot more now. But it would have been nice if it was kind of all the way through, you know. Finally, Dave. Um, David. Sorry, I called you Dave. You can call me Dave. <laughs> you can call me Dave. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your thoughts. What's your advice? Um, my advice definitely is, you know, I'm definitely of the let your talent speak. And, you know, you said something really, really insightful. You know, don't censor yourself. You have to be, you have to be genuine. You have to be 100% yourself. If you're not 100% yourself, and it's just basically pointless. It's really, really pointless. Even just don't apply. That's the way I say it. Just don't apply. If you're not going to be yourself. If you're not going to be yourself, don't apply. Because you're going in there. Not, you know, not for Kofi. It's interesting to hear that, right? <laughs> the name part. That's, that's interesting. Um, because even with me, I, I, you know, I'm from East London, as I keep saying. And I love East London. But I've been in environments where I've had to speak very polished English very high-end stalls, speak to some very high-end client, royalty, and slang was never on the table. I couldn't be my authentic self. I had to literally censor myself every sentence. But what if you think, what if you feel that um, being yourself is not going to get you anywhere? So, for example, Kofi used the name Keith. Mm. So you thought, if I use the word if I use the name, sorry, Kofi, I'm not going to get this job. So that's not him being fully authentic to himself. Mm. He's having to use another name, right? So, so what? It's all about being your authentic self. But what's your advice if you really think that you're not going to get anywhere if you are your if you are authentic? Well, then you you, in all honesty, you have to look at what you're applying for, why you're doing it, why are you doing it. Let's take employment off the table. Why are you going to do something if you're not going to give it 100 percent? If on the other side of the table, that person that you're sitting in front of is not going to allow you or not even going to take into account that you're giving your 100%, why are you there? Are they worth your time? Yeah. Are they worth your time? Absolutely. Are they worth your time? Because the employer should at no point turn and say, do you know what? It's not, it's, that's not a bit of me. I, I'm not feeling this person. Or do are they a good fit? The, place, the workplace should be diverse. Mm -hmm. And that's what it should be um and if it's not then why there are a few maybe exceptions where it has to kind of fit what you're doing but i think personally it should be quite diverse and you must uh, you know as my parents say you must put your best foot forward but if the employer's not doing that then they're not worth your time as you said nick amazing thank you yeah definitely. Uh, no I, I think this whole episode has been incredibly insightful i mean just I can feel my eyes and my, I'm just going, wow, what, what? Just to understand more about, you know, people I work with on a daily basis. And there are probably so many more stories, especially internally, to understand more of and give a platform to. I think Blue Square does really good at being a diverse employer. 
you know, coming from, you know, being in the LGBT community, um, you know, that was never, it was never a, oh, like, you're, you're gay, I'm not going to hire you. Do you know what you mean? It was always based on your talent. It was always based on what do you bring to the table. And I agree, you know, there are, there are companies out there that don't do that. I think that we're quite lucky that we are in a space where we can do that. And with the whole point of this podcast, it gives a platform to show as brand partnership group, as a company, we employ the best people for the best roles based on what they bring to the table. Doesn't matter your race, your background, your culture, your ethnicity, it doesn't matter. If you are the best person for that role, you will get that role. And you should never feel like you have to use a, a, an English, and I say English yeah. in quotations, or a, or a, 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 a less, more necessarily white associated name, mm. because if you're talented, and I've seen you work, you're a talented gentleman. You mm. should Thank you, you should get you should get what you deserve based on your talent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's my firm belief, anyway. And just for our listeners out there, if this episode has kind of sparked any more kind of thoughts, or if you want some additional resources, we do have a couple that we recommend. So we have the um, Black Minds Matter UK website as well as Beloved, which is B-E-L-O-V-D, and of course, ACAS, which tells you a little bit more about Black History Month and its origins. Amazing. So thank you uh, to our lovely, lovely guests, David and Kofi, for episode four of Inclusiverse. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.